that. Don't tell him that. But I was a really good typist. Uh, I think the significance of this, you've all been through the exhibit, and you realize the significance of the foreign policy achievements of President Nixon. It has been called the golden age of American diplomacy with a very good reason. Any one of the significant achievements that President Nixon had during his presidency would have been something that every other president would have been proud to say was his crowning glory and achievement. But Nixon had success after success after success. And the, one of the important reasons for that is the man sitting right here, Henry Kissinger, who, believe it or not, when Richard Nixon was elected president, he decided he was going to choose a national security advisor. He wanted to have national security, foreign policy, defense issues be paramount in his administration. But he called on someone he had never met before, Dr. Henry Kissinger. Would you like to describe what that was like when you got a call from the president-elect of the United States asking you if he wanted, if you wanted to be his partner in changing the world? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I want to thank Julia for her very friendly introduction. <laughs> and which left me in the position I was once at a reception where a lady walked up to me and said, I understand you're a f fascinating man, she said. Fascinate me. <laughs> <laughs> now about uh, uh, to give you an explanation of how my appointment happened. Trisha knows that her father was always nervous about asking for something that might be refused. So I, I had an appointment with President Nixon for about two hours and I didn't quite know what he wanted. And I knew he wanted wanted something. And so I left and nothing happened. And a week later, John Mitchell called up and said, well, are you going to take the job or not? <laughs> and I said, what job are you talking about? And he said, oh my God, he screwed it up. <laughs> so then I was asked to come back. And at that moment, at I, to my disgrace, I say, uh, you, you here may not know that I had been closely associated with Nelson Rockefeller, who was the principal opponent of President Nixon. So I said to President Nixon, shamefully, I'm not bragging about that, I said, I've been working for Nelson Rockefeller for 15 years, and I'd like to think about this. <laughs> and he should have told me to get lost. <laughs> and he said, take a week. So the next day I went to see Nelson Rockefeller. And it shows you something about the mi mindset of that time. And Nelson Rockefeller said, has it ever occurred to you that Richard Nixon is taking a much bigger risk on you than you are taking on him. <laughs> and that was true. And, and that, that, that a newly elected president would appoint in one of the principal jobs of the government somebody whom he had never met and who had publicly opposed, uh, supported his opponent it's an enormous tribute to the way Richard Nixon thought about foreign policy, that he focused on what the right thing to do was. And, uh, and then <clears throat> we worked closely together, and the 
credit for that really goes to Richard Nixon, not to me. And uh, I just wanted to make that point. I just want to do a mic check for myself. Is everyone um, okay? Can we all hear? Raise your hand if you're having any trouble hearing. A little bit. Um, How can you raise your hand to that question <laughs> if you can't hear? <laughs> well, um, if you would like, we can have additional microphones, but since you're all doing such a good job of not hearing as it is, I think we'll just carry on. Um, <laughs> Dr. Kissinger, you have met some of the greatest statesmen in the 20th century, going back to Charles de Gaulle, Eisenhower, Many other people, Mao, Zhou Enlai, Sadat, Golda Meir, but talk to us about the particular qualities of President Nixon and his statesmanship. Why was he able to do what no American president has been able to do really before or since? What quality, personal qualities of leadership did he have and statesmanship that allowed him to be so successful? Well, the task of a statesman in my view, is to take his society from where it is to where it hasn't been. And in order to do that, he first has to analyze the situation in which he finds himself. He then has to analyze the situation of friends and adversaries so that he can determine what assets are available and what risks he's running. And then he has to chart a course. And then he has to get that through the bureaucracy that has to implement it. So, so these are all uh, qualities that a statesman needs. Nixon uh, was extremely studious. He did not like inconsequential discussions. And to induce him to see people just to chat was a formidable, usually unsuccessful task. So he had a lot of time that is occupied by running the office to read think pieces and to read books. And uh, I have to say about these two people, I'm talking so much because I'm afraid when they talk, they might talk about human rights violations that were committed against them while they were working on my staff. Uh, and, uh, but we on the we when we were preparing we uh, you could not persuade Nixon by just making a recommendation to him. He wanted a think piece, and we could be sure that if we prepared a thoughtful piece. He'd read it. And so over months, uh, we could work out policies. For example, when we went to, uh, on the trip to China, Nixon knew when he went into, came into office that that's what he wanted to do. Uh, as it happened, I had, on the academic field, I'd also thought that it was a good idea to do this. But I had not, of course, been in a public position to do anything about it. So we systematically studied 
what the absence were. And uh, then early in the administration, there was a series of incidents at the Russo-Chinese border. And we analyzed those, and we came to the conclusion that probably the Soviet Union was the aggressor. So then that created a strategic challenge. Here is a country with which we had no diplomatic relations and no means of contact, which maybe was going to be attacked by the Soviet Union. And we had the Vietnam War to, to uh, deal with. And so uh, Nixon agreed that we had to make clear that from the point of view of the global balance of power, we were, inter we were not indifferent, in fact, that we would be concerned. So here is a country on the verge of being attacked that was reviling us every day in its media. But the Chinese noticed this. And I won't go through every step, but it took us three years of very uh, uh, patient. Uh, and some of the communications the Chinese sent to us were inscrutable by Western standards. It, it, it said there was the first real communication, I mean, it's been published, was that we get a Chinese communication that said, this is the first message we had. It was from us, from ahead, through ahead, to ahead. Uh, that was true, but how to go from there to a visit in Beijing? So all I'm saying is Nixon was infinitely patient about this. Uh, and the essence was when one of the maxims of Nixon's were, Nixon was you pay the same price for doing something halfway as for doing it completely. So you might as well do it completely. So he, so the strategic structure of the United States was uh, uh, <clears throat> was based on these maxims. For another example, in 1969, uh, we decided that we were going to try to push the Soviet military out of the Middle East. And uh, that sounded crazy at the time. And I stupidly said this in a press conference, that this was our objective. But everybody thought this was so ridiculous that they... But we did it systematically by thwarting every Soviet move based on military force until Sadat decided that he could make war with Soviet arms but in order to make peace, he had to use American diplomacy. So these are examples. I, and of course, the same was true of Vietnam. In the literature of the journalism, everybody said, oh, Nixon likes war, and so he's continuing the war. We had a strategy that was designed to, to to get an honorable end, and we defined honorable as meaning that the Vietnamese people should have the right to make their own choice, that we would not turn over a government that our predecessors, not we, our democratic predecessors had, in, had in, helped install to a country or to a movement that <coughs> That was the only issue in the Vietnam negotiations. Every other had uh, been settled. 
And I can tell you, Winston was my closest associate. And uh, when he started, we were discussing, he was young, would he be better off being outside protesting? And he decided, no, he was going to stay, and he was going to help finish it. And there was a dramatic moment where the top Vietnamese negotiator, Lee Duc Tho, turned out, handed us a piece of paper which accepted a proposal that Nixon had met publicly six months earlier. And uh, when the meeting ended, I turned to, Nick, to Winston and I said, we've done it. It was a high point of my governmental career. Uh, it turned out we didn't do it because the Congress cut off support uh, for the Vietnamese because we were torn in a lot of domestic. But this is the way Nixon approached statementship. First of all, I, I agree with you about the high point, certainly for me personally, and the great honor it was to be there. But it seems to me you have evoked another dimension of statesmanship, particularly with Nixon, and that is courage. Uh, to make tough decisions. You say the statesman has to take the society where it is and move it to where he sees it with his own vision. That's another way of saying making unpopular decisions because others can't necessarily see where we're going. And I think one example is the China visit. I remember now it's conventional wisdom to say, well, it was inevitable we were going to open up with China someday. They forget how controversial that was and could have been. I remember flying back on Air Force One, and there are others in this room like Dwight Chapin and, and Ron Walker and others who remember this, that the President and Dr. Kissinger were concerned about the public reaction in the United States to this initiative. We were not aware of the colorful, dramatic television images across America that had made this dramatic and popular. And so this is just an, an example that even on coming back after the Shanghai communique, uh, Nixon could not be sure whether it was going to be that popular as it turned out to be. So it seems to me, and you may want to give other instances, but whether it was on Vietnam or other issues, it wasn't just he knew where he was going, but he was willing to take a lot of unpopularity to get there. Actually, in the, in the film you're showing, I was sort of amused to see Pat Buchanan was narrating favorably about the trip to China because he was on the presidential plane coming back and all the way back Pat was beating up on Nixon and me how we had sold out the conservatives and how this was. Uh, but he's now seen the light and I'm happy to see him and he's now recorded in the, in the museum here. <laughs> Talk to us for a minute about the division of labor between Nixon and Kissinger. You know, there are plays written about Nixon and Kissinger. There, it, it's almost like the two of you had to be together at the same time, that Nixon without Kissinger wouldn't have achieved the things Kissinger without Nixon might not have. Well, Nixon was president, and he's the one who made the decision. If the, he sent me to, to China without telling the Secretary of State, and if the trip had failed, uh, nobody would have blamed me. Uh, he would have had the responsibility. And uh, then in 72, two weeks before he was supposed, we were supposed to go to a summit in Moscow, and less than six months before an election, and the North Vietnamese had launched an offensive, he decided to blockade North Vietnam and resume bombardment. That goes against every principle of domestic politics to do that. And he looked only at the national interest. And at the height of Watergate, when the Russians threatened to send uh, 
or we thought they threatened to send troops into the Middle East, uh, he launched the airlift and we went on alert. And in none of these things can you see it. None of these things could have been done if I had had to go to him and convince him of doing something he didn't want to do. Now, he, as I said, did not see as many people as the normal president does. So he and I spent a lot of time together so that I knew his thinking. And uh, Winston and I were talking about the following incident in China. On my second trip to China, I was supposed to prepare the Nixon trip. And we had drafted a communique to be issued on the Nixon trip. And when I was in China, I had no communications with Washington because there was no adequate communication system. So we submitted what we had drafted and they looked at it for an evening. At first we thought we can work within that framework. And then Choi and Lai came back from Mao and said, this is nonsense. You're pretending to have an agreement when there isn't a full agreement. So I propose, or we propose, that we list our disagreements and then we put in a few agreements. That will make the agreement believable and it will... Now, here I was sitting in Beijing with no means of communication. And I was prepared to junk the approved communique because I was sure that Nixon would see the good sense in that Chinese proposal. And that's exactly what happened when I came back. I mean, they were then, of course, there are always things you need to fix, but as a concept. So Nixon and I, in we always, I know no exception where we did not agree on the strategy. And when I went off on a negotiation, it, I never received any cables. Can you remember this? In, in all the negotiations, there was, and I sent him a daily report, except when I was in China. I sent him a daily report. I never got a reply that said, you shouldn't have done this, or even a reply that said you should do something else. Uh, and so, but it wasn't that I said, convinced him to do this. It grew out of a dialogue that was really permanent. And that's really how we, uh, uh, how we worked to, together. He would be reading books and, and memos and, and uh, I'd be called in for these discussions and they'd go on for quite a while. Uh, and I was sometimes hoping for a water break out somewhere so that I could get back to my dad <laughs> to, to the day-to-day -day stuff. But it was a very close cooperation. Uh, you mentioned, you referred earlier to Nixon knew where he wanted to go and took the patiently took the steps to get there. You've also talked and written about the way that Nixon and you saw foreign policy not just as American-Chinese relations or American-Soviet relations or American-Egyptian relations, but you saw the interconnectedness of it. Would you elaborate on that for a minute? First of all, you have to look at the situation that Nixon found when he came into office. The Soviet Union had just occupied Czechoslovakia a few months earlier and they were concentrating 42 divisions at the Chinese border in which both the Chinese and we thought they might attack but we had no communication with the Chinese. We had a war in Vietnam and within two weeks of Nixon coming into office 
The Vietnamese started an offensive in which we had 500 casualties a week. Uh, we had in one month more casualties than we had in the whole Afghanistan uh, 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 experience. Uh, the Middle East states, most of the Middle East states had broken diplomatic relations with us in, because of the, during the 67 war in the previous administration and Egypt and Israel were conducting an undeclared air war along the, the Suez Canal. And all of this happened in, in the first week of the war. So one basic principle we had uh, is that you have to be able to link these various efforts together. You can't permit, say, the Soviet Union to have very good relations over China, but conduct a war in the Middle East. Uh, and so one of the first things that was done was we sent a letter from Nixon to all the departments saying that we meant to link these things. Of course, with all the respect, the State Department loves to negotiate. So if you interrupt the negotiation for strategic reasons, they think that's the beginning of a negotiation, not a presidential order. <laughs> so, but if you watch the basic policy of Nixon, uh, he was trying to link conduct in international affairs. And if you take, for example, the Iranian negotiations we just had, I don't know what precise ideas he would have had, but I know he would not have wanted to make a military agreement without a political component. And so this was the basic uh, approach. Uh, Henry, I would add that in terms of the landscape that the president inherited, the domestic turmoil, uh, the riots, the assassinations, the protests course, against the war, yes. uh, and which seemed to me made it even more complicated. And seemed to me one of the great achievements was to lift the morale of the American people and also the credibility of the United States in the world that we were not mired in Vietnam, we were not crippled by a domestic turmoil, that he could make bold minutes. moves uh, and therefore change the landscape. So, uh, we thought it was exciting to work in that framework. That was the essence of it. And, uh, and I think those are the essential reasons for its success. Talk, um, if, if you would, for a minute about the foreign policy legacy, the whole legacy, not just China, not just Vietnam, but what is the overarching legacy of President Nixon's foreign policy um, advances? Well, first of all, he inherited a domestic situation, as Wynn pointed out in which there had been assassinations, constant demonstrations, and obsession with the Vietnam War. He put before the American people an alternative vision, and he said, we are about world order. And that's why we want to have relations with China, and that's why we are prepared to talk to the Soviet Union. And Europe also should look at it. I mean, these were his, uh, his uh, basic themes. And he had always been accused of being a warmonger. And once his policy got going, some of his critics were saying, if Nixon is for peace, maybe we ought to look at peace. Maybe there's something wrong with peace. And, and, and Nixon suddenly found himself accused of being soft on the Soviet Union 
after having gone through two alerts, uh, ordering two alerts, one in 1970 and the other in, in 1973, uh, and in the world, uh, <coughs> whether people agreed with every last thing that we did or not, there was a sense that the United States had a sense of direction, that we knew what we were doing, and we knew or we were trying to balance the incentives and the penalties in such a way as to get the best uh, uh, possible result. And uh, I, I, therefore, I believe, and I have written it, and I'm going to say it again in a speech in England, I think Nixon was the most consequential foreign policy president that we've had in the, uh, in the 20th century. Now, uh, the American psychology and history it's not, we, we tend to think that if there is tension somewhere, it can be removed in one negotiation. We don't look at underlying causes. We, we think there's a problem, we fix it, and then we can go away. Our Chinese friends think the solution of a problem is an admission ticket to another problem and that therefore you have to look at the sequence of events and so it, you, you couldn't do with the Nixon foreign policy, you couldn't step out there with one great speech like saying, like Kennedy saying, Ich bin ein Berliner. Uh, the Nixon foreign policy was complicated. Uh, but if you look at its pattern, it had a purpose. And, and that is the lesson that sooner or later we'll have to learn as a country. Because we are now so connected with other people. And, the, uh, and when you think of final solutions that gets you into a frame of mind of, that led to World War I, which you can't afford. Nobody can afford. So, so this is the real legacy of Nixon. Isn't any one of these steps that were taken that we've described here, but the pattern and the way of, of thinking. You probably more than Please, go ahead. Uh, Ron Walker. Okay, if you can't do it without a mic, so there you go. Two thousand and seven. Ron. How come I never have crowds when I arrive? And I said, Dr. Kissinger, I don't know. You always arrive with the president, and, that, and therefore, that's where the crowds are. You came in on a separate airplane on 970 in 1970 to Rome, Venetia Airport. Winston, you may not remember this. I grounded up, rounded up, maybe 50 to 100, maybe 100 workers on the ground. And as you were exiting the airport, you, to you came out and you had a big smile and you stood on the ramp and you gave it one of these. <laughs> what was that? Do you remember that, sir? Ron Walker has just re reiterated one of the great moments when you were in, your, in Rome. Rome. And you were pretending you were Richard Nixon and you were doing the B sign. Is that right? You had been very disappointed that you had never had any crowds for your arrival. 
So we made arrangements for you to have a very responsive crowd that said, Viva Nixon, Viva Kissinger. <laughs> Thank you. What did I do? Uh, I've got one final question. Which you know, is, advanced men. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> sometimes lose their sense of proportion. <laughs> I don't remember that I would have been so suicidal as to imitating President Nixon. <laughs> um, I have one question about Nixon the man. Now, you saw Nixon the, the great diplomat, Nixon the world leader, Nixon the president. But what was Nixon the man like? You were with him at his highest moments of achievement, and you were also with him at some of the most difficult moments. Talk about, if you would, share with us just the sort of personal courage of the man who, as Governor Wilson says, I'm not a quitter. The man who kept going even when times were tough. The man who had the courage and, and found deep within himself some real moral character. <clears throat> Nixon had an impulsive side so that he might react quickly to a challenge. But you knew that if he thought about it again, he would put it into a... So I separate what he might... So you can get a lot of quotes from these office conversations where he'd say, we ought to do this, and we ought to do that. Uh, uh, and, but if you read on, you see it never happened when it was put that way. Uh, in personal conversations, certainly I, have, I never saw him raise his voice to any staff person. Uh, I, uh, he was extremely polite. Uh, I mean, he was just when, like you, Henry. Just like you, exactly. Polite, <laughs> never raised his voice. <laughs> always very respectful and appreciative. Um, I think before... I, I think I found him... It, I, I remember my working with him with great pleasure. They were never... I, I can't think actually of a single confrontational moment. There were points where he thought he had a different view or where I had a different view. But I can, I really cannot think in any of the big policy decisions. I mean, I read all this stuff where he would send me a cable in order me to do something different. That never happened. We, when I went off, it, we, had usual, we had always settled Whatever needed to be, uh, whatever needed to be done, he was. But he was, he was substance oriented. So he didn't like to talk about a lot of gossip. So most of my conversations with him, I'd say 95 percent, if not, were on substance. Uh, and, I know that you have to leave, but is there anything you want to leave with us? The people, many of the people in this room were with President Nixon in the White House, in the administration, were there in the golden age of American diplomacy. A number of other people are just, they're young, they're studying about President Nixon. What do you want to leave us with is the final thoughts about Richard Nixon, the president? Well, I think the fundamental problem of American foreign policy remains the willingness to ask the questions with which I start. And it, it, our administration, our government, very rarely does that because our machinery of government is geared to, de to answering tables that come in with problems. So there is no good mechanism there is a theoretical mechanism, but of, I've now worked in one way or another with 10 presidents. He is the president who has been most concerned with long-range purposes and with wanting to know where we're going. And really what people ought to take away is uh, 
There are no flashy solutions to the Middle East problem. The solution will be to understand correctly what are the forces, which are the forces we need to balance, which are the forces with which we can cooperate, and which are the ones we need to defeat. And then we have to find with whom we can do it, or whether we have to do it alone. Those are the deeper questions. And so anytime somebody says, he has the solution to the Syrian problem, the Syrian problem is based on the fact that when you put so many uh, nationalities and religions into one political unit and then try to decapitate the head, they'll start fighting with each other. So unless you reassert some authority, there is no clever intellectual solution. And I feel very strongly we have to start teaching this attitude in our schools of foreign service and foreign policy because that's at the heart uh, of it. I unfortunately have to get to Los Angeles where my son has assembled 50 Hollywood types. As usual. And he will not be as friendly as you are. <laughs> as usual, Dr. Kissinger has to leave. Dr. Kissinger's reputation was that he always had a beautiful actress who was waiting for him, a beautiful Hollywood actress. So he has just announced that he's going back to Hollywood. Some things never change. Thank you all.